but I think we all deal with spaces, and I think that's the common ground, and I hope that I can share with you. Um, in geography, we deal about geographic, we, we're interested in geographic space. We represent geographic space, so uh, in prior times, you know, geography, describing space, uh, coming up with models of explaining space, and now, nowadays, in geography, we have moved also to the big data science. We try to model space. We try to do it in real time. We try to do it in many dimensions. We also deal with big data sets, complex data sets. So we have the same kinds of problems that you have in terms of small spaces, if you like, if you think about uh, microscopical spaces that you study. We are dealing with macroscopical spaces. And uh, we are having sort of, well, the same kinds of problems in terms of trying to model a complex reality and then also trying to predict, perhaps, uh, the next step. So these are the kinds of things that we do in modern geography, modern geography meaning uh, dealing with process and prediction rather than description. So in my environment, I'm interested how humans use these models. So if we design wonderful displays, my question is, do they actually work? So this is something I'd like to um, perhaps give you some insights or share with you in terms of my particular work. Um, we generate representations, representations about things in the real world. Um, and of course, we need to also think about how people perceive and cognize the real world. So we are at this interface of human literally system or world interaction. And um, this is going to be the only, maybe a one more, uh, brain map that I'm going to show you. So um, bear with me. So why are we dealing with graphics? Well, graphics are used uh, to decide, to decide many things. How many of you have used a map to come here? Uh, well, I did, in even a paper map, not even a smartphone, uh, because, of course, connection time is expensive uh, with a Swiss phone in the US. So yes, we use maps. We use even paper maps. And we use plans. And we are making decisions upon these kinds of maps. You know, if the snowstorm is going to hit Boston, then um, you know, what, how should I be dressed to survive the snow masses? So this is actually kind of, this example is a, almost a kind of a little revolution in terms of uh, news graphics. USA Today, we decided, well, we want to communicate weather patterns in a way that everybody can understand it. So we have these colorful displays. And of course, we have other kinds of graphics, even in the courtroom, that you know, lots of dollars decision making is involved. Supposedly, one of the jurors um, decided that indeed, yes, that uh, the Samsung display or whatever um, company was copying Apple. And, and we know the outcome of this. So lots and lots and lots of dollar decisions are being made using graphic and graphical displays like these. I don't need to explain you this. You know more about this than I. Um, and also, we can use graphics to study perhaps uh, issues that are related to fraud or, or this, this trying to get a sense of how human behave. And we have this uh, graphic here, a statistical graphic, uh, was published in the PNES, where visualization has been used to detect voting fraud, potential voting fraud, I should say. So certain patterns look suspicious. You have here two axes. You have voter turnout here, percentage of voter turnout. You have votes for the winner. And let's say you have a pattern like this. It's very suspicious that you have 100% you know, voter turnout and everybody votes for the winner. winner. This pattern, of course, is not proving that there was fraud, but it's suggesting an insight into where one has to dig deeper to discover potential problems in the data or human behavior. And then, of course, we have these kinds of graphics. And this moves it um, to my domain, where I'm interested in finding out how, does particular, how do particular graphics influence human behavior and decision making. So you have these two uh, representations here. And um, one can argue you know, they are designed in some way. You can have a discussion which one is better or, or worse uh, in terms of the design. And then you can ask people to make decisions about perhaps the belief of the science that is in the paper 
accompanying this graphic. So you have people rating um, a given paper once you show this graphic with the same text, once you show this graphic with the same text, and you study how believable, perhaps, um, the communication of this paper is just using one or the other graphic. And you will see that people believe in this particular case, they rated um, the scientific reasoning in the paper, the text, to be in some ways more believable, more scientific, uh, more accurate, just when using a brain scan rather than a density surface. So you can see that the graphic itself, the design of a graphic can have an impact uh, in terms of communication, a direct impact, not only communication about something, but also the belief of how well or how bad something uh, works. So this is the domain where I'm uh, working at, where I'm, I, where I'm interested in. So we generate these displays. They're quite abstract. Some of them look very similar to your kinds of displays. They don't deal with uh, proteins or molecules. They deal with people behavior or uh, documents, text documents in a database, or the accessibility of services in a city, uh, or the, uh, in terms of Wikipedia, where and how cities are mentioned, and if we can build a city network just based on text documents uh, stored in Wikipedia, and see what the structure of the world would look like in terms of cities if we're just using this database as a representation. Voting behavior, presidential election in the US, and so on and so forth. So we have all these very complex abstract displays telling us something about the real world or about human behavior. And the question is, do they work? Can we make better decisions? Can we actually make decisions based on these displays? I believe we should and we, we do, but um, actually uh, it's not that easy as I thought it was uh, many, many years back when I, when I started to do this. So other people have thought about this relationship about visualization, about data communication, about analysis, using visualization for analysis. And so there's this movement that has emerged in, um, in science, in, in all over uh, science, and has been picked up also by geographers in terms of using visual to do analysis. So the, the visual as a window into very complex decision making for data analysis and data mining. And um, the question here is that you have computers that are very good at crunching numbers. So you can submit your very large databases to these computers to do stuff for you. And then you have a human, and the human in the end makes a decision. And the question was, which of this pipeline, of this visualization pipeline, which should you offload to whom and what to make it most efficient. So clearly the system, the computer can do the large number crunching. Um, but at the end, again, still, if you want to derive knowledge, you need a cognitive agent that is able to do that. So the question is, you know, in what way are we optimally organizing this process of data visualization in terms of later on data understanding, knowledge generation, and decision making? And so my interest in this pipeline is mostly on this side. Once we have given to the system the relevant information or the information, once the system has done the computation, we generate it in some kind of form that is cognitively perceivable or perceptually um, adequate in some form that a human can make a decision. And the question is how? How do we do this uh, optimally? So you say, well, I'm a geographer, I'm a cartographer. Uh, is she not you know, better off you know, studying psychology or working with psychologists? Yes, in fact, yes. These are questions that also psychologists address. Um, to show you a bit of the difference of looking at the elephant, so to speak, from different sides, um, the cognitive scientist or the psychologist um, is interested in finding out how humans decide, make decisions, uh, perceive, cognize the information. And uh, in a way, they have the human at hand and, and try to fix the human if something is not working well in this particular uh, pipeline. Um, I'm not very good at fixing humans, so I'm, I'm concentrating on the easiest, uh, easier part. I'm fixing the design. So I'm thinking, 
well, um, if something is not working well, what can I fix as a cartographer and geographic information visualization? I can fix the display. So if, if I test people using these displays, they make certain decisions, I want to know how much the display has an influence on these decisions, then I can actually manipulate or fix the display. So both sides, of course, are very important, and both go together. So I'd like to share with you um, a couple of ideas how we can actually fix the displays. How, what are the primitives we can modify, um, manipulate, to make displays more effective? That has been sort of the quest uh, in the last years um, on, on my side. And we found out that the things we do in cartography to, to make maps, uh, these primitives can also transfer to other spaces, like, for example, biological spaces. And I hope you will tell me uh, more in the next couple of days um, how or how not this can actually transfer. And uh, we can have a discussion on that. So to, to start off, I'd like to uh, run an experiment. I know it's been broadcasted and, and recorded, so don't tell the NSF that we actually ran an experiment. I don't have human subject clearance. I'm Swiss, we don't have to do that uh, in Switzerland, so I'm, I'm, I'm well off. If you have seen this before, don't give it away. So for the others, uh, you have a task. We'll do a little uh, animation here. We animate displays. There are two displays that are animated. And um, I will ask you, once you see a change, just to raise your hand. Don't give it away what, what has changed. Just raise your hand as soon as you see a change between these two displays. Are you ready? All right, let's go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So slowly people are seeing it. And some will not see it or will take a lot of time trying to figure out and see it. And I will relieve you. And once you see it, you're like, I can't believe I didn't see that. So what is happening here? Um, just to relieve you, um, did you see that? What I'm showing you here is the idea that um, we have the world, we have a scene that we've seen before probably, and we are showing this representation in a certain mode, and suddenly we have trouble seeing large changes in the scene. It's an amazing amount of pixel change in this very simple picture. And this is a picture that is not even abstract. We don't need to sort of decode it. So you can see here that visualization is powerful. Animation is believed to be very powerful. But we have a problem, a perceptual problem, where we are trying to use animation. And this is something I'd like to uh, tell you a little bit more about. So we use animation, we use visuals to detect change. We want to see the data pattern. We want to see you know, what has changed from state one to state two. And just simply flipping a display back and forth, you can even say, I'm looking at the display, I'm blinking my eye. Um, this is kind of the, the, the speed at which this is changing. Even then, I'm looking at display A, I'm looking at display B in a static sense. I'm just flipping back and forth. And even then, I may have a hard time seeing significant change. Um, a couple of uh, researchers in cognitive science psychology have discovered this phenomenon and uh, called change blindness or in this particular case, attentional blindness. I told you that there will be change. And even then, uh, it was hard for some of you to discover it. So the question is, can we overcome this problem? So we have a display. It has visual variables. It has color. It has orientation, lines that orient differently. It has shading. It has things placed on a scene at a particular location. It has shape changes, and so on and so forth. It has these visual primitives. And the question is, can we take advantage? Because we don't want to have that in visualization, these kinds of perceptual phenomena, right? Or we want to mitigate them in some way. So can we use the graphic primitives to overcome these problems, these perceptual problems that are real and exist, and we have to just deal with them? So that's my, that was my question. And I did not randomly choose these primitives that actually artists use. That's the artist palette, you know, 
Picasso um, draws a painting or drew a painting and Van Gogh drew a painting. These are the primitive, the graphic primitives that they use to create their masterpieces. Well, in cartography, we too, we use these graphic primitives to create maps. And so these are the building blocks for any kind of graphic display. So the question was, which of these visual variables, or how do these visual variables perform? How, which of them would be, for example, the best one to use to overcome this change blindness problem? Or having the change blindness problem, which of the variables would be more robust in terms of data visualization to overcome or mitigate this uh, perceptual problem? So what we are, what we were doing is trying to take this set and test it against these perceptual problems. And uh, for those of you who don't know Bertin's system, this is really sort of, quote unquote, the Bible of cartography, if you like. This is sort of what's taught in first year one on cartography 101 around the world. This book has been translated, has originally been written in French in the 60s and then been translated in all the languages you can imagine and be used in classrooms to train um, future cartographers, uh, most often also in geography departments. So this is the, his set, and he organized it in a very specific way. You see, the first visual variable is actually the graphic mark on a two-dimensional scene, and in, in fact, its location. Where is that graphic mark placed is the first visual variable, and that visual variable has many of these properties similarity, difference, order, and quantity, meaning you can use it to communicate similarity in data, difference in data, ordering of data values, for example, or actually the quantity of the value. I will give you an example later on. <clears throat> the second most important is size, and you can see the importance is ranked in terms of properties, dimension, data properties it can communicate. So size is the second most important because it can be used to show difference, similarity, order, and so on. And then it goes down the list, and shape is the weakest one. According to that system, to, according to the theory of this cartographer, Jacques Bertin, he had a good idea, good intuition. And in fact, this is what cartographers intuitively have done for hundreds of years. He put it in a nice little theory. But unfortunately, he never really tested the theory. So we don't have empirical evidence that this is really working. Um, however, uh, more recently, psychologists, neuroscientists have done a survey on these visual variables in terms of, in neuroscience research, in psychology research, what are these elements that guide attention? in cognitive and perceptual agents. And oftentimes, this work has been done on monkeys and, and so on, so very fundamental basic science, basic research work. And you can see these are the variables, the undoubted attributes of guiding attention, the probable attributes of guiding attention. If you look at these words, these are really the same variables that Bertin had sort of thought about a long time ago. I'm, I'm also, of course, showing semantic associations, but I'm, of course, totally leaving this out for the moment. We're looking just at perception. So you can see shape, probable attribute, value that I'm uh, shading, if you will, is the luminant onset and luminant polarity. And then you have size, orientation, color, and you could see motion. Motion is guiding attention, but you just saw how hard it is to discover significant change, even using motion. It does guide attention, but then you, have, you may also not see, um, even if you are attending to. So this is this phenomenon we saw earlier that Rensing and colleagues have discovered in terms of this change blindness uh, effect, that you have two images. You intersperse them in a certain sequence with a gray sort of visual uh, buffer eraser, if you will, so that your short-term memory is actually forgetting uh, the first scene. You have scene A and scene B, or scene A and scene A prime. And uh, this is this particular phenomenon that we just saw earlier. And we use this to now test our visual variables. So here is an example of classic maps modifying size, orientation, hue, and value, these classic visual variables. And um, just uh, to show you how that works, we can close this. Um, 
I'll just show you. Should be another one. We don't. This is not a German test, but uh, I'll just give you an example size and value, and run this animation in terms of a map. And you can show, look for yourself which of this change in which of the maps, same data, just showing it in a different way, doesn't matter what it is, but test for yourself which change can you see faster. That was our question. And probably most of you will see that change in terms of size change faster as the change of color value. And we have tested that with uh, quite a few subjects. And in fact, we, in this particular case, and I'm going to stop this, and otherwise some people will have, may have sort of uh, epileptic attacks or something. We'll want to avoid that. So we did, this in, did these tests using these different visual variables, and we actually discovered really in essence that people, in terms of the, let me go first here, in terms of the theory of Bertin's theory, that predicted really well the performance of the subjects. Meaning that if you look at these visual variables, you have the visual variables on this x-axis, on the y-axis, you have response time until they discover the change. And you can see that orientation, lowest on the list, or down low, is, takes much longer to be seen then a change in size, fastest, and then hue, color hue, and color value. And then when we ask people not only can you see a change, but then also tell us what changed, localize the change, tell us what exactly the attribute of change, um, then you can also see that orientation actually is not performing that well. So in fact, in this particular case, size was really um, the best variable. And we can, of course, do this in different ways or look at the data in different ways. We can also look or check where do people look on the display. We track their eyes. So we use eye tracking while they're performing this task, and we can check whether how long it takes that they look at that relevant change area. And again, here, mean to time to first fixation, we see that orientation is taking much longer to be discovered with, your, with their eyes than the other visual variables. And here we have uh, a very interesting um, data point that is when you use eye tracking, you have also again this sort of fundamental belief that where the eye looks is where the attention is. That's sort of a basis of eye tracking. If you don't believe in that concept, you cannot actually run eye tracking experiments. And yet you can also see that there are issues here that in fact people can respond to the correct visual variable let's say size. However, they don't even need to fixate that particular zone in the display, meaning people can still get the right answer, not even having to look at, attend to having the focus of attention in that particular relevant zone. Meaning in visualization, you also have that. You have issues of peripheral vision. You have things that go on on the screen, rotation, translation, flicker, and so on and so forth. And people may be able to discover things at the corner of the eye even without looking. And it looks, it turns out that even size was, um, that is so attention grabbing, if you like, has so, such power in terms of guiding attention, even for this kind of variable, people don't even need it to look at that relevant uh, place in display. I'm just gonna go back real quick to show you um, something that we used to predict our results. So these are actual behavioral results that I just showed you. What you see here in dark, very dark, because this is the model output, we ran a so-called uh, neurobiologically inspired attention model. It's a, it's a computer model. It's a based, in a way, on, on a neural net approach to predict if we were to show these flickering displays, these quick changes, where would the model predict that people would look first based on what is known in terms of the perception, the neuroscience of perception? So using value here, this particular visual variable, um, people would automatically, all people would see the first changing, the correct changing zone. If we used size, 
only 88% of the people would first discover. This is the first eye movement discovered the correct changing zone. And as you can see, um, so this is the top candidate, the second candidate, and then orientation here is um, the, third, the third and the fourth, the last would be color value. So this is a model, this is a prediction. And it turns out that this prediction is not quite right. In fact, the behavioral data showed that first was size, Last was, these, was orientation, and these two, there were actually no really significant differences. So we also use um, work out of cognitive neuroscience to be able to predict or test um, our visual displays. And then we evaluate or validate them with actual human subject experiments, as you can see here. So here are actually um, the summary screen, so you see here, this is actually behavioral data. This is changing where the star is and where people, all the people that we tested, I think 20 to 30 people we had, um, the more people agreed upon or looked at, the lighter in the screen. So most people actually saw that change. Uh, this is aggregated results for this display. Here you can see with the orientation, the weakest variable, they actually didn't even discover the changing zone. And in value here, you see um, they were quite good. And here also, they actually discovered the changing zone. So we use existing theory that has been developed, often not empirically tested in visualization, and been used in infovis, in biological visualization, and so on and so forth. We, we take this theory and we test it really um, empirically based on a couple of different kinds of approaches. So this is an example on those visual variables. And I would like to go into color because color has become really one of the most you know, used and strongest <laughs> visual variables. And you can see, again, I'm going back in time. You see the USA Today display, how it was sort of discovered or sort of proposed in, for newspaper communication of weather um, patterns and, and weather maps. And you can see not much has changed. This is actually data displays that have downloaded from NOAA, um, daily um, weather uh, data that is being uh, made ava available. Um, and you can see, you know, the iconography, if you like, is, is the same. And the question is, is this a good way to communicate weather patterns using, particularly in this case, this color scheme? So this is, again, something we wanted to investigate. It's been used over and over and over again. We use, we call this the spectral scheme, you know, like the electromagnetic radiation spectrum, you know, this, the light from the sun going from the short waves uh, and the blues, uh, ultraviolet blues and the greens and into the longer waves, the reds. This is a scheme, I think it's even the default palette in many of the software packages that are used, be it MATLAB or uh, Informatica, or whatever, whatever the, the, the packages are, and so on. So we wanted to know, is this actually a good, uh, a, a useful color palette? And um, we use the same kinds of approaches that I told you about earlier. We ran a prediction, use a cognitive model, a perceptual model, um, to, on two designed maps. This is the, sort of the standard map that is well known. This is a cartographically enhanced map. Um, I, I say enhanced because it's not like what the cartographer would do, but it's in a controlled experiment the closest to what a cartographer would do. And these are actual measured um, with eye tracking uh, test subjects. So what you have here is the model. Here is the actual one result. And the question was very simple. The arrow points to the true direction of the wind. That's a very simple question. And we showed this to naive subjects. They had no idea about weather patterns and climatology and so on and so forth. And you need to know a little bit about Coriolis devi deviation. You need to know about low pressure and high pressure cells and so on. No need to know about this just to see purely attention from a bottom-up attention perspective. Where would people look to solve this task, not knowing anything? in terms of how strong would the attention guiding property of the visual variable work. Color is very strong. And you can see people were checking the legend to try and make sense of what's in the map. And in fact, this particular color scheme and the variable temperature had nothing to do with the task. It was not needed to solve the task. What you needed to know about is these pressure lines. So, Again, this is the cartographically enhanced map. 
information that is not relevant for the task is demoted graphically, and the important information is highlighted graphically. And in fact, this person, even not knowing anything about the task, at least looked in the right place to be able to solve the task. And you can see that this vision model here is performing really well in terms of predicting for the cartographically enhanced map what the pattern should be, the eye movement pattern, for this cartographic mess, as I may call it flippantly, the model is actually not predicting at all. So in other words, we as cartographers have now realized that um, one of the attention guiding designs in cartography is make thematically relevant information perceptually salient. That's what the theory really says. And so in this particular case, I can now use a, a neurobiologically inspired vision model to test my display, to, to tell me, yeah. is this really, is, are these figure ground, these contrast relationships in terms of thematically relevant visual, uh, variable visualized against the background? Uh, are they working? Are these relationships working? So this is quite exciting for us in cartography. So then we can test this in a classic experiment. Uh, we had people looking at this kind of map. We had the same task on this kind of map, and we can test now not knowing anything, how do people perform with these two maps, not knowing anything about climatology and, and uh, weather information? Um, in fact, they are guessing. They're not performing at all. They're really pretty much guessing because they don't know. Um, this is what this column says. So this pre-knowledge, when no one knows anything about it, you see in terms of accuracy of response, there's no difference between the good map or the bad map or what I call here the cartographically not so... Uh, inspired map, and here the cartographically inspired map, fine. When we train them on the weather patterns, we train them how to solve this task, performance rises. Great, we have done a good job in training, but you can also see there's no difference in terms of the display. Each display performs equally well in terms of accuracy. All right, however, if I, now, if I now look at speed of response, how quickly people make that decision, you can see here with um, the cartographically inspired map, they are faster not knowing anything in the pretest. In the post-test, this pattern stays the same and in fact even increases. So once they know what they should be looking for and the map display is designed more efficiently, effectively based on cartographic theory, people are actually faster. Or in other words, not supporting the content effectively with the graphics slows people down. This is what this graph really says. Okay, so this is a way you can see that we can have these, we can take these visual variables, color, shape, size, and so on and so forth, the primitives of visualizations, we can take them and we know quite a bit about how they perform in what use context and we can target them and use them in very particular, hopefully efficient and effective ways. And now we have also a bit of a handle how we can actually validate our graphic designs. We can use theory out of cognitive science and psychology and neuroscience. We can apply it to our designs. We can test and validate the designs to be sure that thematically relevant information is actually shown in a perceptually adequate way. I'm checking uh, a bit on time. How am I doing? Just to see. 25 minutes. OK. So here is another classic. Um, so we talked about color, how important color is, and the color choices. And in fact, cartographers have also proposed uh, wonderful tools uh, for optimal color choices to solve these kinds of particular perception problems with the maps, the weather maps that I just Carl told you about. And I'd be happy to share all these tools, or the names at least of them. And you will find them now even integrated in R and in MATLAB and in any of those you know, well-used uh, to tools. Um, um, and, 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 and so on. Here is another classic, aside from color, is very similitude or realism. So the idea is the more real or realistic looking the display is, the easier it is for broad audiences to understand what's communicated. So of course, you know, Google Earth, Google Maps, you have here the 
continuum of, uh, say, Crater Lake, you can may recognize it, right? You know, this is obviously Crater Lake satellite image, and then uh, this is a shaded relief map, and then it gets more and more abstract, and down here, of course, there's no resemblance with the real thing in the real world. But I can still understand that this is Crater Lake. So there is this continuum, and the question always in cartography and in geography was, how much realism do we really need to be able to communicate uh, complex relationships? And this is what we tested here um, using a very simple task. Um, assuming you are a helicopter pilot, you have to land your helicopter, and uh, there is a rule about how steep the landing spot can be in terms of helicopters or planes. Uh, it cannot be more than 14% slope incline. Um, given you have map A, B, C, or D, you know, solve this task. This was the base question. And the question was, of course, people would believe, oh, it's easier to see steepness really in these shaded relief maps because we can see the darker, the steeper, and so on and so forth. That will be sort of the first naive understanding of these maps. And in geography, cartography, we believe often that you know, these kinds of maps, they are quite abstract. These show contour lines. And you have to do the computation in your head. What is its steepness? Well, it's the difference between these two lines. You have a given interval, and then you have to make that computation yourself. And down here, everything is presented to you. That's actually the most thematically relevant information perceptually saliently communicated. It tells you where is red, you cannot land. Where is green, you can land. And then there is everything in between. So this is a classed um, slope map where all the information is actually given to you. You don't have to infer the information. So we can quantify how hard these maps are for these given properties of information extraction. Um, well, how is the them thematically relevant information depicted? Um, how is the slope type or the incline communicated? Is it implicit? that I have to compute it myself from what is seen, or is it explicit, the degree of realism here. Then we can even apply, again, additional vision models to measure the clutteredness of the display. And um, we can also make an inference of how much internal reasoning is required to come to the solution. So we can test this, and we did this uh, then with actual users. Um, we compared these maps with one another in terms of percentage of correct answers. We used signal detection theory in terms of the mode of data collection. That's on the side. And surprisingly, or non-surprisingly for cartographers, most answers were correct with the slope map. And that was surprising. The, the shaded relief maps that have more information than this map, they actually performed worse. So the Initial belief, you know, Google Earth, you know, why we have Google Earth, you know, because we can see the landscape and we have the shading and, you know, this is 3D-ness aspect, it's cool and I can fly and find my house, right? That's kind of this intuition that 3D is actually better and realistic is better. And in fact, people don't perform as well. And the one that we think was the hardest to use actually performed second best. And if you ask people about their confidence in using these maps, they actually reflect very well their performance, which is also surprising. So people were most confident with a slope map and performed best, and actually they were second most confident with the contour lines and performed second best, which is a big surprise to us. In fact, and the naive intuition that this would actually be much more preferred and performance would be better um, actually did not hold true. Right, so here's another one. Realism, to think about how much realism do I really need? Do I need to see the molecules completely in this three-dimensional shape with the shading and you know, nice specular displays and so on? This adds information to the display that is maybe detract, detracting from the task. So again, here, a balance of realism and abstraction is always something we have to think about, about uh, in terms of design. Another classic is animation. Should we use animation or not? And there's a lot of papers that have come out in the early 2000s in psychology to say, well, no, animation is cool, everybody uses it, but in fact, it doesn't work. 
And in our case, we wanted to find out what actually doesn't work. Why does it not work? Are there elements that we can actually improve in terms of animation? We have a lot of knowledge on static design, hundreds of years of knowledge. We have very little knowledge on how one designs animations effectively, and that's something I'm still working on and interested in. So here we have a, a simple test. We have the same information showing in a small, called small multiple display, for those of you who know Tofti's terminology or Bertin's terminology. Um, and here we have an interactive animation, and we have also used a non-interactive one. In fact, this is actually the non-interactive one. We have a play button, and then the animation just runs through. And the question is, you know, old question, which one is better? And in fact, our argument was, it's a silly question. There are things, research questions for which animations are better, but we have to design them well. And there are research questions for which static displays are better, and we have to also design them well. So you, cannot, you can compare a good animation with a bad display, static display, good static display with a good animation. We have to do fair experiments, and in fact, there's no way that we can really, really test really well a static display with an animated display because they have to be designed differently. So in terms of a psychological test, it's a silly endeavor, in my opinion, but one can have long, long discussions with psychologists on this issue. So here we see, this was the sort of the idea. Here I wanted to actually prove that this is silly to compare these two things. Because when I have a static display, I have the two-dimensional scene. I can go back and forth when I want. I'm not forced into a animation where I have to wait to have the display come back and refresh again, right? That would be, first of all, why we should not be able to compare these two things. They can do two different things. You know, we don't compare apples and pears, right? We accept that they are different, and we eat them. And so the same thing with this animation business. And I can show here, and we used eye tracking to do that, to show how people use animations or view animations differently, simply when they are differently designed, for example. So you see here an interactive animation. Down here, they can change the speed. And they, down here is a research question they have to solve. And here is a non-interactive version, just one button, play and stop or play, and then it stops automatically, and you have to play it again. And you can see very clearly, very simply, different design, different viewing patterns, because there's different things you can do with the animation. And um, we thought we were so cool, we had provided here a backwards animation button. How often do you see that, that you can run the animation, a data animation, backwards? Because we, there were questions we asked where that would have been actually most efficient and useful to use. However, I'll get back to this in a minute, um, because if you have the static small multiple display, and you can see this eye patterns are very different, right? And people, in fact, don't just view the animation sequentially like you are forced with an animation. People choose to go back and forth, and in fact, do all sorts of interesting things. And that's why we had this backward animation option. We thought that would be a good design decision. And in fact, if you actually test it, you can see we have backward motion, forward motion, how many times people actually used or clicked on backward or forward. And you can see different speeds here, too. There's a stop button. This is forward. This is backward. And you can see people, even we trained them. We actually forced them to use the backward button to, for training. Half of the people actually decided not to use it, even though it would have been better for them, just because it's probably less known. And so that's, even if we have a cool design idea, we cannot be sure if it's novel, unusual, that people will actually benefit from it or have the idea that it could be beneficial for them. So that's another issue in, in uh, visualization. And in terms of speed, what we also realize how important it is to actually have people be able to co control the speed of an animation. Because 90% of the time, the animation provided on the web and so on run much too fast. And so you can see here a design decision having smooth morphs between the images. It's called the tween, interactive tween version. Here we have smooth um, uh, 
abrupt changes between the screens. And you can see why, because we have the change blindness idea, right? So change blindness would be, for example, more significant if you have abrupt changes. So you can mitigate change blindness with morphing. But if you do that, you can see here the morphed versions. When you look at the speed at which people run the animation, you have here milliseconds per frame, more here, and shorter. So people actually, for the non-tweened one, have to actually slow down the animation. Otherwise, it's too fast. But if they slow down, then you have a greater chance of falling into the trap of change blindness. So you have these design decisions, mitigate change blindness, adding morph. But with the morph, um, maybe it's too slow or too gradual that people won't see the change. On the other hand, too abrupt problem of not seeing the change because of change blindness. So these are just to show you that design decisions, just having morphing or not, will also affect how other design decisions, like having speed buttons that can be modified, need to be in place as well. So we have assumed we can just fix the display and then everything is OK. We realize that, of course, there are different kinds of users. And that's where psychologists come in. Because there are different kinds of viewers, and we need to adapt our displays for these different user groups. So we have um, discovered that individual differences and group differences, gender, for example, or elderly and young, that will be a group difference, or individual difference like spatial visualization skill, an IQ type of test, that this also affects how well people actually perform with the visualization and which kind of visualization. So a famous predictor, for example, for uh, geographic navigation and also map use is this one. Who has ever heard of the water level test? OK, great. One person. So that's, this is great. So here is a very simple test uh, discovered or developed by uh, Piaget, uh, a Swiss psychologist in the 50s, and his student, uh, Inhelder. So, they actually discovered this or studied this for showing transitions from spatial uh, skills from birth to adulthood. And so they were showing these to children and trying to figure out when, at what time in the development process, do people actually understand higher level spatial concepts. So in this particular case, you have this bottle, A, and just you know, think of a bottle, then I tell you, I tilt the bottle, tell me what the water line looks like. That's the task. Well, and children below four will draw something like this. Okay, And then when they get older, children understand, oh, there's something with gravity, and I actually have seen bottles already, and, and, and in fact, something changes. It's probably looking like this. And then at some point after seven years old, people get it, you know, young children get it. OK, this is what it actually doesn't change in terms of the water level, regardless of the tilt. This is for children, right, you think? Well, here are psychologists who tested undergraduate students, not in the worst school, and I'm not saying where, thousands of them. And what you can see is you have uh, three tests. And again, these are th more than 1,000 students. So each of the pairs is a test, test one, test two, test three. It's just repetition of the same tests. And um, you have down here in the axis, you have people who perform well on the test. These are the high spatial people. This is uh, the group that performs sort of medium well. And you see here this axis, 60% correct. 0% correct. And down here, you have a, a group of low performance. And what you can see, but don't get excited, males in the group here, uh, you can see that this color for females and this color for males, that is not homogeneously dis distributed across this axis, right? You can see uh, more males in the high performing groups than in the low performing groups. That's what this really says. Gender effect, very stable, very robust. And this is what it is. It doesn't mean they're better people or worse people, but we know that there are gender effects in terms of spatial visualization in this particular task. And this task is a very strong predictor of using certain 
visualization displays, maps, for example, to navigate in the real world, to find a way uh, in the real world. Um, we also need this information because we also design maps, maybe not for navigation, maybe just for data information purposes. And what we do find, if you just look at this simple task of discovering or reading off a simple value of a display, an interactive map, these are eye movements, fastest participant, 11 seconds, 25 fixations for solving the task, slowest participant on the same task, 521 seconds, thousands of fixations, and probably not getting it right. So we do know there are different kinds of users, and we do know, and we do have to know their background to be able to design displays more effectively and efficiently. Here's another example. We have these high, high spatial. We tested them with another test. It's a mental rotation task. Um, and we tested our study group for a 3D visualization task. And we can see that the low spatial and the high spatial in blue under a particular time pressure scenario and the low spatial and high spatial in red on a particular uh, time pressure scenario perform differently. So we have a task context that is different, time pressure or not. And we have different user groups that we know about. And you can see in terms of using Google Earth and employing panning, rotating, zooming, and tilting function in Google Earth, they will do it differently for a particular task. And here's a gender effect for the particular task. I'm not telling, telling you the details of the task, but just to show you another very classic. So if females supposedly are not um, so good at um, spatial navigation, spatial uh, visualization. Well, males sometimes think they are so good at it, but they're not. So here you have a very robust, well-known effect of overconfidence in tests. And uh, here you have the male, the blues, and you have the females. And in, in this particular case, they were tested on using these things and, and actually performing a task. And males believe that they were performing much better at the, as they actually did. And this has been shown in many, many different use contexts, including map making. So this is another important um, two minutes, another important um, issue to think about. Finally, we have not discussed um, emotion and affect, just a little outlook into what we are doing now. We are interested also in testing people's emotional attention, if you like. What is the emotional effect? What is the effect of aesthetics in display? So what we do here, we use the same principle as you saw earlier. And we also measure people in terms of skin conductance, heart rate, um, sweat levels, and so on and so forth, to try also to have another data point. We have now spatial skill. We have design, the human background. And now we would like to also know, you know, there are some displays that are just beautiful. What makes them beautiful? And if we know that, are people more attracted to them and therefore also attending to the display uh, better? Uh, does it make a difference in decision making if something is just beautiful? And we try to measure that and giving you different kinds of maps. They look really weird. This is more a traditional looking map. This is more like a Van Gogh map, very weird. And we know that people actually react emotionally. This is skin conductance to viewing this particular map. They have a different emotional response than, and I'm just going to click forward to make this a bit quicker here, and I'll explain in a second, than this particular map, this more traditional looking. So can we capitalize on that? And what you see here are pupil changes, also giving you a data point on emotional attention. And then the lines here are showing the changes of the pupils um, to give you an insight, again, on where was the emotion, this is the emotional, the arousal surface over the viewing event where it's darker, they have more emotion than when it's lighter, less emotion. Uh, so we are starting to do this as well. And I'm going to stop here. And if you want to know more, I invite you to join us. We have an International Commission on Cognitive Visualization led um, by a colleague in Australia and myself. It's under the umbrella of the International Cartographic Association. And so join us. It's you know, for everybody to participate. You, don't, you just have to sign up if you want to have information. And we share information about cognitive research, perceptual research, in terms of visualization, typically geographic visualization, but also transfer 
to spaces that are small, medium, and large, including the spaces that you are interested in. So that's it from my side. And I would like to thank you in this, to be so attentive to this world-willing tour of geographic visualization. Thank you.